Hey, it's really, uh, I know it's homecoming week, uh, but I have to tell you, every time I, I come onto this campus, and uh, uh, it really does feel like it's coming home. And uh, I, what I wanted to talk to you about, and am going to talk to you about, is, the, is really the importance of focusing in on your passion and how that's critical to have a really exciting life. But I'll tell you, just by talking to many of you uh, in the room, it seems like this message uh, is already uh, reaching a crowd that is really engaged uh, in, their own fashion, in their own passion. So it's an honor for me to be here. It's an honor for me to be with you. And uh, I'm excited for uh, the game and our conversations uh, from here on out. So I wanted to start a little bit about uh, a story of a transformation that happened to me while I was here. And uh, the story starts in 1988. And 1988 is an important year for this university because that was the year that the governor and the state legislature determined that College Park would be the flagship university. And with that, they would try to achieve world-class status. And it was put in, codified in the, in the law, and there was a lot of emphasis and a lot of funding to the university to kind of bring us to the next level. And I say that because it was, uh, at that time, a different university than it is now. And it was also the same time that I was applying here. And I had trouble deciding where I wanted to go, but I ultimately decided to come to the University of Maryland. But I made that decision late. And by doing that, my housing uh, choices were somewhat limited. And I ended up, uh, which at the time was only one of uh, an all-male uh, uh, dorm. And it was uh, Ellicott, Ellicott 6. And at the time, we had called it appropriately Hellicott. And I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure if Ellicott or Hellicott is still around, uh, but this was, uh, first of all, it's a bad idea to have an all-male dorm, but that's a, that's a separate issue. But this was a tough, uh, tough group of people, and I would say at the end of that first semester, uh, close to 40% of that hallway had actually either failed out or were kicked out of the school. It was kind of a rough crowd. I don't know why I got the luck of the draw. There were some good memories. I remember flooding the, they had these long hallways, and I remember flooding those hallways with soap and having slip and slide contests. Uh, but by the time two of my hallmates had been expelled for throwing a 200 pound Coke machine out of the sixth floor hallway, uh, it was really kind of clear to me that wasn't a great uh, spot to, to, uh, to be in. And uh, so I turned to other areas to look into uh, you know, ways to connect with other people. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't that enamored with the Greek system. I went on to join a fraternity later, but at the time that wasn't of interest to me. And I remember going into the SGA at the time, uh, you know, seeking just to get involved and connect to people. And uh, earlier that fall, we had elected King Tom in the monarchist party. And I don't know if you knew this, but in, at that time, we had elected uh, a monarchist to our SGA. And the main platform for that uh, administration was to build a moat around the University of Maryland and fill it with beer. So you could tell that was, I was having a tough time. And I would say, coming into the university, Marsha alluded to, I'm one of many that went here. And uh, so I, there was pretty, I had pretty high academic expectations. And I actually found the work here, the academic work, to be really hard. And uh, it was even harder, you know, those introductory classes with the, a lot of students. And it, it's kind of hard to really connect with anybody. And the long and short of that, by the end of that year, I felt fairly lost. And I was looking for an escape. And I remember uh, exploring three options more seriously. The first one was to, to do one of these fishing. Uh, you get paid a lot of money to go out in Alaska and fish for three or four months out of the year. I think there's a show on uh, Discovery Channel on that. Now, mind you, I've never fished a day in my life, but somehow that seemed uh, appealing. <laughs> I love skiing, so I thought, oh, maybe I'll just sort of take a year off and explore uh, you know, the hospitality industry. And I remember pitching, uh, you know, developing hospitality skills to my PhD educated father and uh, that not going over so well. So that was sort of uh, out of the question. And I came to the final decision, which was, okay, I'll go out to Colorado, go to the University of Colorado, Boulder, and I'm going to enroll there. And I actually put a deposit down and I went out there. But as I was walking around the campus, really three things hit me pretty hard. One, I was fairly disappointed in myself. Two, I was fairly disappointed in this university. But three, I wasn't ready to give up. And I remember on the, on the way home, uh, you know, really getting clear that if I was going to go back, I was, good, I was going to go back not just merely to you know, kind of fit in, but I was going to go back to make a difference, right? Make this university uh, better, warmer, uh, and, and, and more connected. 
And that's really, that's really the aha moment. You know, you read about connecting your passion to something beyond uh, yourself, and that was it for me. And I didn't know it at the time, but I sort of looking back and thinking about that experience, that's what happened in that moment. And I would say that that is not only, that was the key to, to my becoming happy here, um, but it is the formula for uh, really a successful and fulfilling, uh, a fulfilling life. So the story of coming back here is really not important, but that decision to come back and dig in and try to make uh, this uh, you know, university better and better for me resulted in going back and working with the different student groups to engage them, particularly with the freshmen, because you kind of come in, you don't, you don't know. And that eventually led to the SGA, which was, uh, you know, funded those student groups. And uh, the long, and sort of all that culminates in, uh, you know, a big effort at the end of, I was served as the SGA president, uh, and it was at the same time that a new round of budget cuts kept really coming at the university, and it really reshaped this university. But what was great about that is it gave all of us as a community time to advocate and figure out what we wanted to be. And I think we're seeing some of the fruits of that. I see some of the fruits of that uh, sitting here before us now. But here's the thing. It's easy to get away from what's most important. It's easy to get away from your passion and to kind of get into the mode of doing the shoulds. And uh, you know, the shoulds are getting the credential, getting uh, something on your resume, following some authority figure. And I see this all the time in my professional life. People come in looking for, uh, looking for you know, jobs and opportunities. And I'll tell you, if you focus too much on the shoulds, it'll suck the life right out of you. You'll get older, and as you get to my age, you realize that, oh, there's just not that much living to go around, and you want to really preserve that for the things that are most important to you. So I really put it to you. Are you clear on what's most important to you? And does that resonate? Is it, are you passionate about that? How do you want to make a difference for yourself, for this university, or the broader community? You know, and as I was thinking about this speech and you and, and homecoming, uh, I started reading, I just finished this book. It's an amazing book. It's called uh, Abundance, The Future May Be Ready uh, Better Than You Think. And the thesis of this book is that, you know, we as human beings really look at the world at, in a linear, at, you know, look at improvement in the world on a linear basis. But the nature of our techno technology revolution that we're going through right now, and just think about, you know, computing power, robotics, genomics, the nature of that technology is to double every two years. Think, think Moore's Law. And that the barriers to dramatically improved quality of life are on an exponential path. Hard to see in the next five years, but if you look at it in the next 15 to 20 years, uh, it, it's a really exciting future. And the reason I say that to you, one, it, it makes you feel good. And I think it's hard to feel good right now because every negative thing that happens on this planet gets amplified out uh, every single day. And so not only does it make you feel good, I think they're right. And I think the opportunity before you, before us, is bigger than we can possibly imagine. And, and, and I would argue that the key to unleashing that potential is really honing in on what are you most passionate about and staying connected to that and letting all the other shoulds and all the other things that distract from that, let them go. Hey, thanks very much. Appreciate the time. <laughs>